Welcome to the army and battle section of my Vampire Coast Guide. In this section we'll be going over the entire faction roster and covering all the unit's pros and cons, as well as compositions and formations for battle. Disclaimer, this guide is based on my personal experience and opinions and is by no means the definitive way to play the game in Mortal Empires. If you have a different strategy or want to add something to mine, please leave a comment down below. Now that's out of the way, let's get into the video. Vampire Coast roster is very on point with their themes, it's nearly totally ranged focus which makes sense for a load of pirates. They have a massive roster of ranged units with a good deal of them being very strong and viable depending on your build. Unfortunately, almost all of them fire in very shallow arcs, meaning they need to have direct line of sight to fire at full efficiency. This means you need to get them in angling battles, or they end up standing around and waiting to die. This does come at the cost of the melee units never becoming amazing, and rather just getting better at buying time for the rest of your units to do damage. The ranged focus also causes the Vampire Coast to be pretty awful at offensive sieges, since it's quite hard to shoot the enemy to bits when there's a massive wall in the way. Fortunately, the artillery pieces are great throughout the entire game, and can give you the helping hand you need to get over or through the walls. The monsters are another outstanding category for these guys, especially once you get to the end game, with almost all of them being viable in almost any comp. Unfortunately, a load of units end up getting unlocked alongside other units that vastly outclass them, so end up getting hardly any use at all, which is a bit of a shame as far as a variety goes. Also like pirates, pretty much every unit in the roster is aquatic, meaning they can't be slowed down by water, and while this is a very niche effect, it's a good thing all the same. One final thing to note is, that like vampire counts, basically everything in your roster causes fear, so will have a gradual effect on enemy leadership if you can keep them in sustained combat for a long time. In Wars of Attrition, this can mean the difference between victory and defeat, even if you're up against more elite units. With that being said, let's get into the roster. Kicking us off in the melee infantry are the zombie pirate Deccan's mob. They're literally a meat shield and don't really have a purpose other than that. They will rarely get kills and rely on your other units to do basically all the work for them and that's just fine. They're perfectly good at what they do, and give your ranged and monster units plenty of time to get into position and take out the enemy for them, and at the end of the day, if they get killed, then it isn't really going to make that much difference anyway, and you can recruit some almost immediately. They come in two varieties, standard and pole arms. Pole arms are pretty much the same thing, but they drop swords in favour of pole arms, which gives them some very minor anti-large damage, but it by no means makes them into damage dealers. They should still be used in the exact same way, but target any large units the enemy brings to prevent them from getting to your damage dealers in the back. I take 4 normal deckhands and 2 pole arms with me in the early game until I unlock anything better, and depending on the faction you play as, this can take quite some time. Next up we have a unit exclusive to the Pirates of Sartosa, the Sartosa Free Company. They're an anti-infantry unit and are great at shredding through tides of enemy chaff with their very reasonable damage stats for the price tag. They also come with vanguard deployment, so can be used as a flanking unit if you're feeling particularly sneaky, but for the most part I never found that to be a massive part of my pirate playstyle. A major difference they have from other units is that they actually aren't undead, so will run away once they break rather than stay to fight and degrade, which can be seen as a good and a bad thing depending on the situation. Overall I'd say they're a great unit, and a good middle ground between deckhands and depth guard, so if you're playing as Sartosa, then they're 100% worth giving a try. Sirenes are next, and again they're quite a unique one, they're ethereal so are immune to most forms of non-magical damage, which can make them incredibly hard to take out, or incredibly easy, depending on if the enemy has any forms of magical damage. They also deal armor piercing damage and have enthralling attacks, which means they'll throw out a massive amount of damage, even versus tough units, whilst also reducing the amounts that the enemy can throw back. They also cause terror, so excel at forcing enemy units to run away very shortly after arriving on the battlefield. I don't think I consider taking a full front line of these guys, since if the enemy brought any magical damage, they'd disappear faster than you can say yar. But a couple of them as a flanking unit to assist versus tough troops might be a good idea, since their high damage and enthralling attacks can really help out your other units. I'd say no more than two of them in a mid-game army should serve you just fine. Finally, we get to the Depth Guard. They're armoured and anti-infantry, and are the top tier infantry of the Vampire Coast. They can not only hold the line better than deckhands, but they can also do some actual damage and pick up quite a number of kills depending on what they're going up against. Of course, due to the nature of the faction, when they're up against the most elite of the elite, they will need some help from other ranged and monster units, but for the most part against standard units, they will do some seriously good work. They also come in two varieties, regular and pole arms. Again, pole arms come with anti-large damage, and in keeping with the improvement over deckhands, this damage is actually pretty good, and lets them win some duels against mid-game calf. They still need help against anything too top tier, but they're still pretty great nonetheless. I take 4 regular and 2 pole arms with me right into the end game, and they serve me well all the way. Now we come to the real meat of the Vampire Coast, the ranged infantry. Kicking us off are the zombie pirate gunnery mob. 
quite like the deckhands, they don't have the best damage output, and in melee they really won't do anything worth shouting about, but from range it's something of a different story. While their damage may not be the best, they're still a gun unit that's unlockable from basically turn 1, and they can fire whilst moving. This makes them great at shooting on the chase or the advance, and means that even when moving into a good position, they can still be getting some shots off and racking up kills. Unfortunately, as with most of the ranged infantry, they fire in a very shallow arc, so need a direct line of sight to get shots off, meaning you'll need to get some good angles and flanks if you want to maximise your efficacy. Once you get the movement down, they can be incredible, and will serve you especially well for a very long time. They do actually come in four varieties, but each one is so different I'll cover them each separately. I take three to six of these guys with me for a long time, first as my backline and then as my middle line, which sounds weird but it makes sense once you see it in action. What are you doing here? Oh, it must be another sponsor spot! What about that? Since we only have about two sponsors for the channel right now, we are going to talk about Audible again, but don't you worry, I've got some brand new spicy books to recommend. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about Audible, if you didn't know. So if you didn't know already, Audible has the world's largest collection of audio books, audio dramas and audio shows in the entire universe, or known universe at least. Uh, they're narrated by some of the most fabulous voices in the world. Voices like Emma Thompson, voices like Claire Danes, voices like my personal favourite, Stephen Fry. You can listen anywhere you want. Once you have a subscription, you can download your book, listen to it offline. So you can listen to it on a plane, on a train, on an automobile. Uh, although you might not want to put your headphones in when you're driving a car at least. You can listen on your computer or you can listen on an app on your phone. It's all downloaded offline. They even have a handy little car mode. Look at that. So you can just easy, one tap, it's going. It's tap it again, it stops, skip back. Select chapters, it's fantastic. So my personal favourites I've listened to so far, I mentioned Mythos in the last one. Currently, I'm listening to The Witcher and I'm loving it. It's not all The Witcher books, it's The Witcher as uh, as it was in the Netflix series. So it's a little bit more condensed and got the more essential well, essential stories in if you want to get some more depth from the Netflix series. It's really entertaining. The narrator makes sure to differentiate between which character is speaking as, so you can really kind of get into the story and get really immersed. You may be wondering how does it actually work? And basically you just start a subscription, it's $7.99 a month by default. Not for you, but we'll get to that later. So it's $7.99 a month, and you get one credit, and you can spend that on any book in the entire audiobook library. When you have a membership, you also get exclusive access to the audio shows and audio dramas, completely separate to your books, by the way. And also, once you cancel your subscription, you get to keep all the things that you've downloaded so far and not give them back. So you could subscribe for a month, and then if you don't listen to that full book, you can just cancel it for a month, finish listening to the book, restart your subscription, get another book, listen for three months, you know, just kind of pick it up when you want. You can also buy extra credits if you need to, and you get discounts on that if you are an Audible member. If you're not an Audible member, you kind of have to pay the full price for these books, which ends up being three or four times the price that you'd be paying for an Audible membership. So it's kind of a no-brainer. Also, if you get halfway through a book and you decide, you know what, I'm not really enjoying this, you can exchange that book. Again, this is exclusive to members only. But you can just say, I don't want this book, give it back, you get your credit back, and then you can spend it on another book. For you, my friends, I have two offers. A 30-day free trial. At the end of that 30 days, it will go into a payment cycle and charge you $7.99 unless you cancel the subscription. So what you can do, you can start a free trial, get a book that you want to try, then cancel the subscription, and then if you like it, I've got another deal for you just right now. The second deal is 50% off your first three months. So instead of paying $7.99, you'll be paying $3.99. And that will get you for the first three months. After that, it will go into $7.99, or you're saving, you know, about £12 there. So you can't really complain about that. Both of these things are only one book memberships. But as I said before, you can exchange, you can get different audio dramas, you can get discounts. So it all really is kind of in one condensed package here that's a pretty good deal if you ask me. I do personally use Audible sometimes when I'm recording clips for videos, I'm just listening to The Witcher and just, you know, getting into it. It helps my time pass much faster, it's great for if you're in a boring workplace or a long commute, uh, on a plane, on a train, going to sleep, you can find relaxing books that can help you drift off to sleep. Anything really, they've got the biggest library in the world, so you've got to find something, right? That's it, all the links are in the description. One of them is for the free trial and one of them is for the 50% off your first three months. Click those down below depending on what you want. It supports the channel and you can get some pretty cool stuff for yourself. What is not to love? Okay, now back to your regularly scheduled guide. Next up are the gunnery mob bombers. I'm just going to skip the zombie pirate part for now because you can probably tell that just from looking. Just about the only thing these guys have in common with the regular gunnery mob is the name, since everything else about them is totally different. Instead of pistols, they now have bombs that cause a hefty chunk of fire damage and are excellent for tossing into a clump of enemy infantry to cause massive damage and disruption. You do have to be slightly careful since the explosions can hit your own units, but it's a small price to pay for devastation of this calibre. Taking these bombs does cause them to sacrifice some range since they can only throw these bad boys within a very close range. This means they end up in very risky positions when they're throwing out, but their low ammo counter basically ensures that even if they do get caught out, they won't go down without having used as much ammo as possible. While I don't think I'd ever recommend a full line of these guys, I'd say three of them in the second line would be very effective at causing some destruction, terror, and mayhem. 
Next up we have a break from the gunnery mob units for another Sartosa exclusive. The Sartosa militia are up next and to be honest seeing these guys is making me almost regret that I didn't get to play them for the guide. They can fire whilst moving, have vanguard deployment and are also decent in melee so are an amazing choice for a mid game front or second line since they do great range damage on the approach before holding the line once the enemy gets near. They're a really great middle ground between the regular gunnery mob and handguns but since they lack any form of good AP damage this is about when their usefulness ends. Fortunately, their melee prowess could make them into a great mid-game frontline before you unlock Depth Guard, so you can get a tremendous amount of use out of these guys over the course of your campaign. I'd say 3-6 to six of them in your front or second lines would be a great choice. Back to the gunnery mob now, and this time we have the handguns. They're a long range variant, and they also come with armor piercing missiles, meaning they're the clear choice for your mid-game backlines as they can cut through most mid-game armor with ease. The combination of long range and good damage makes them amazing at taking out approaching key targets with ease, but as usual, they do need direct line of sight, so once melee begins, they do need to get on the flanks to continue firing at full efficacy. I like to take 6 of these guys with me in the mid game right up until I replace them at the end game, and I use them as my third line before some shorter range units like bombers or the next unit. Hand cannons are the final of the gunnery mob units, and they're kinda like the replacement to the regular gunnery mob since they have about the same range but vastly better damage. They fire armor piercing missiles in the short range and can obliterate enemy units before they even see a lick of combat. Unfortunately, this great damage does need a direct line of sight, meaning they need to be on the front lines when the enemy is extremely near, so unless you want to use them as a very weak front line, you're going to have to do some serious micro to stop them from being locked in melee once the lines clash. They're a great replacement for either regular gunnery mob or bombers depending on your preference, but unfortunately I never found myself using them for long since I unlocked way better units at practically the same time and ended up binning them before long. That being said, when I did take them, it only took about 3 to make sure I had some variety in my lines. Finally, we get to Deck Gunners, and they're the elite of the Vampire Coast ranged infantry. They fire armor piercing missiles over a massive range, and are experts at taking enemy units to pieces before they even get close. Of course, they do need a clear line of sight, but the massive range means they can easily do some great damage and move back into position well before the enemy get into melee. I did find them to be particularly choosy about their sightlines however, since if even a piece of grass was in the way, they'd refuse to fire and either stand around waiting for death, or run towards their target seemingly forgetting they can actually attack from far away. Despite this, they are the best ranged infantry in the roster, and in contention for the best in the game, so I obviously take 6 of them with me into the end game to replace my handguns. First off, the monster units are the Felbass. To be honest, I didn't really get much use out of these guys during my playthrough, but I do have plenty of experience with them as the Vampire Counts, so I know well enough how they work. They're a great unit for blitzing enemy backlines with a swarm attack before quickly retreating to safety once they bring in reinforcements. A single unit of them is fairly useless, but once you get a couple of them going against a single enemy ranged unit, you'll have a recipe for a very dead enemy unit. They do struggle once the enemy units get a bit more armor or melee prowess, but for the stage in the game you unlock them at, they're a great unit as an alternative to another flanking unit such as dogs. I think a couple of them in a balanced early game army would be just fine. Next up we have the Bloated Corpse. Ideally, you want to have full armies of these guys and nothing else since they're the most OP unit in the game. JK, they're real bad. Don't use them at all if you can help it. They're literally just fat dudes whose only purpose is to run into a clump of the most expensive enemy unit they can find and blow them up to do admittedly good damage. This all sounds good if it wasn't for the slight downside that they die every single time. So it's like taking up an army slot with an ability that can take out a single enemy unit. Yes, it's nice to take out that unit, but it's also an army slot that could be taken up with something that could take out the same unit and also be around to talk about it afterwards. If you can help it, then avoid them completely. But if you really have no other choice, I'd take no more than a couple and replace them with literally anything else as soon as you can. Scurvy Dogs are next up and they're the only real cav-like unit on the roster. They're super fast and have vanguard deployments, so are great at getting around the enemy to take out their more vulnerable units in the back. They perform similarly to the Felbats in the sense that you need multiple units to take out one enemy, but they are slightly better in sustained combat, so you may be able to get away with one on one fighting if they're against something supremely weak. Overall, they aren't amazing and can be interchangeable with Felbats depending on what you value most. For better one on one fighting, go with these guys. For fast blitz attacks, go with Bats. Either way, I'd say two units in a balanced army are plenty to handle, especially if you don't love your micro. Animated Hulks are next up, and they're more of a front lines fighter. They deal armor piercing anti infantry damage, so are great at wading through hordes of armored and unarmored infantry alike. At least, that's the theory. In practice, they aren't that amazing versus more elite infantry because of their large size. They end up taking a massive amount of hits and dying rather quickly. To get the most out of them, it's best to keep them embedded in your front lines with an infantry unit to provide a barrier between your damage dealers and the enemy. Even then, I'd still say it's best to give them some support from range to make sure they can deal with whatever it is they're fighting. 
I'd say bringing a couple of these guys with you into the mid game would be a great addition to any army, even if it's only to make your meat shield that much thicker. Mongols are next and they're a bit of a weird one. They work kind of like stealthy cav, but they aren't as fast or have nearly as much charge bonus. They do however, deal armour piercing anti-infantry damage, so are great to get into a chunk of infantry and ripping it to pieces. Unfortunately, like the hulks, they have large hitboxes, and as such, end up taking a lot of hits when they're on the very front lines. Fortunately, their stealthy nature will allow you to send them around the enemy to get into their backs, even though they will be head to head with the large number of units attacking them, they will ensure that they route before they can do too much damage. While they don't possess the same speed or backline harassment abilities as the scurvy dogs, I do see them as a worthy replacement due to the great damage and frontline flanking prowess. That being said, just a couple will do since they are a bit of a niche unit and shouldn't take up the entire unit capacity. Next up we have Rotting Prometheans, they're basically big hermit crabs that are great at bogging down enemy advances and sticking around while doing so. They're armoured and deal armour piercing damage, so are great versus some heavy infantry since they can do some great damage without taking too much of a heavy beating while doing so. They're also defender units, so while they aren't the best at getting kills, they are great at sticking around for a very long time and giving your ranged units plenty of time to do what needs to be done. This does mean they need a lot of ranged support to be most effective, but I still don't think that takes away from their usefulness. They also come in two varieties, regular and gunnery mob. The gunnery mob variant is basically the same thing, but with some gunners on the backs of the crabs. Unfortunately, you can't aim these gunners or see their range very easily, but they will constantly fire when the enemy is in range and give these guys some good passive damage while in combat. This doesn't change the fact that they need support, but it does make the job just a little bit easier. It's always worth getting the gunnery mob as soon as you can, but for both these guys, I'd say two is plenty, and I use them to replace the hulks I picked up earlier. Next up is one of the crown jewels of the Vampire Coast roster, the Necrofex Colossus. This behemoth is an artillery monster hybrid, since it has a hand cannon that can fire over massive distances, as well as great melee capabilities from its huge size and sturdy construction. The ranged fire is in the form of massive armor piercing missiles that tear through basically anything they get fired at. I personally chose to send these missiles against anything that was cav or larger, since the massive damage almost felt like a waste going against infantry. But honestly, you can send it against basically anything and it'll be devastating. They also deal armor piercing melee damage, so if they get flanked or run out of targets in range, they can always wade into combat and take the names of almost anything on the field. I like to keep mine at the back with my artillery and take out as many enemies as I can from range before the lines clash. Once they do clash and I can't get a clean shot, I send them into melee or keep them on the flanks to take out any flanking attempts before they cause me any trouble. Honestly though, there's no bad way to use them. Now if you want to cheese the enemy harder than Cathedral City, you can take 19 of these with Noctilus or Swan 1. But for me personally, in a balanced army, two worked just fine. The Rotting Leviathan is our second to last monster unit and it's quite the beast. It's a massive single entity that deals armor piercing anti-infantry damage and causes terror. It's amazing at sending into a clump of infantry by itself and can rack up a massive number of kills even without any help, but of course, if you want the most effective method, you do need to give them just a touch of support. Their massive health pool makes them great at keeping enemy units busy even if they do get surrounded and hit on all sides. Of course, no unit can keep this up forever, so it's integral not to waste the opportunities they give you and focus your fire where needed. I take two of these guys with me into the endgame to replace my Prometheans and keep them on the flanks of my front lines so that I can send them where needed once the enemy gets near. Finally, we come to the Death Shriek Terrorgeist, and wow, this was a disappointment. I don't know what it was, because Luther on one of these was great and did loads of work exactly how I expected, but the one time I tried to use this by itself, it just seemed to wander around aimlessly and get shot at. How have you not killed a single organ gun unit? What the hell is going on? What in the name of God are you doing? First of all, the breath ability seemed like a coin toss as to whether it'd activate once selected. I can put that down to unit routing, so I'll let it slide. I sent it against an artillery unit, and not only did it not kill the unit the entire battle, it also didn't even stop it from firing. That I can't let slide. I was expecting big things since I loved using these as the vampire counts, but it was nothing but disappointment and has found no place in my army since. It might just be me, but I'm not a big fan. Next we have our missile monsters, and it's really only one unit with three varieties. The deck droppers are basically a gunnery mob unit that's been picked up by some bats, and honestly, I don't know how much else there is to say because they perform exactly how you'd expect. They're pretty good at getting behind enemies and shooting them in their backs while they're locked in melee, but if the enemy has any ranged units at all, then they'll shoot you out of the sky the second they stop moving. They're also quite good at getting artillery caught in a crossfire and killing it quickly, but you do have better and cheaper options if you're going to send two units to take on one. All that being said, I do still quite like these guys because they're just so unique and a very fun unit to play around with to harass the enemy. The other two varieties are the bombers and the handguns. They are basically the same as their ground-based counterparts, so I won't waste too much of your time going over them. 
Bombers can drop bombs that are better at taking out clumps of infantry, but this comes at the cost of reduced range and ammo. Handgunners have better range and armor piercing missiles, so are really the direct upgrade to regular deck droppers since they do have the same job, but are just better. For any of these guys, I'd say two is enough since they do have quite a niche job, even if they are quite good at it. Finally, we get to my favorite category, artillery. First off, we have the mortar, and it pretty much does what it says in the tin. It fires anti-infantry explosive projectiles that are great for sending to clumps of enemies, especially if they're lacking much armor. It doesn't have the best accuracy in the world, so it's best to use it on stationary units in a clump, or to keep a gunnery white nearby to make it a touch more accurate. It also fires in a huge arc so it can easily fire over units' heads without too much worry of friendly fire, aside from the aforementioned poor accuracy. This is a great unit, especially for when you unlock it in the game, and while it is unfortunate that it has limited upgrade options, I do take a couple of them with me right into the endgame because they're just that good. Our final unit is the Carronade, and it's basically a cannon. It fires armor-piercing anti-large projectiles in a shallow arc, and is great at taking out cav and softening up monsters before they hit your lines. Unfortunately, the shallow arc does mean that it basically needs a clear line of sight to hit enemies, so once lines clash, it does feel like it stood around waiting for something to do. Nevertheless, it is a great unit, and I took two of them with me right up until I replaced them with Necrofex Colossi. Now we come to the Regiments of Renown. I'll call out each unit, what they're a unit of, and the differences they have to regular units of the same rank. The Tide of Skjold are a deckhands mob unit and gain Frenzy and Rowdy. The Bloody Reaver Deck Guard are a Depth Guard Halberds unit and gain Enrage. The Black Spots are a Gunnery Mob Handguns unit and gain Melee Attack and Defense, Weapon Strength and Charge Defense versus Large at the cost of 1 Missile Damage. Shade Wraith Gunners are a Deck Gunners unit and become Ethereal, gain Magic Attacks, Melee Attack and Defense, 75% Physical Resist, Strider, the ability to attack Gates and Discourage at the cost of Shield Breaker, 15 Missile Damage, 800 HP, and all armor. Night Terrors are a Mongols unit and gain melee attack, weapon strength, charge bonus, and the ability to cause terror at the cost of a rampage risk. Gallows Giants is a Necrofex unit and gains melee defense, weapon strength, missile damage, fire attacks, melee bonus versus infantry, the burnt effect on attacks, and a flamethrower at the cost of losing the cannon, range, and the ability to fire whilst moving. Salt Lord Scuttlers are a deck dropper bombers unit and gain armor sundering at the cost of 2 missile damage. Lamfrey's Revenge are a rotting Prometheans gunnery mob unit and gain 2 missile damage, regen and charge defense versus all. Queen Bess is her own unit and don't need no base unit. She's totally unique and is only unlockable via a right, and there can only be one of her at a time. She deals devastating range damage versus basically anything and she's best used against huge clumps of infantry and can shatter units in a single shot if she hits them in just the right spot. She also does fire damage and is honestly up there with my favourite units in the game just because it's so much fun to see her in action. Now we come to my ideal balance comp for the endgame. For my front line, I take 4 depth guard and 2 depth guard pole arms with the pole arms on the flanks to protect from cav charges. I take 6 deck gunners and they'll deploy ahead of my melee units before moving back once the enemy gets near. I take 2 rotting leviathans and put them on the flanks to take out any units trying to attack my sides. I take two Necrofex Colossi, who start at the very back line and move forward as needed. Two Mortars also on the back line, a Gunnery White in the middle of the artillery line, and finally a Lord, preferably with access to the Lore of Vampires. You should also use ROR where you can, and for this battle I use the Bloody Reaver Deck Guard, Shade Wraith Gunners, Gallows Giant, and of course, Queen Bess. To see how this performs in battle, I'll pass you over to live commentary Miles. Take it away. Thanks for that, Miles. Right, we're just going to see this slowly come into action. Decided to go against the High Elves today, since it's who I was going up against a lot in the old uh, the old campaign. Normally use the Empire, but uh, just fancied a difference for uh, who I'm fighting for once. So their army is comprised mostly of uh, quite a lot of infantry, a couple of cav units, a few phoenixes, and of course, there's a lovely princess and a mage at the back there. Now I'm just going to wait for them to get into range, because Queen Bess outranges their longest range artillery. So this kind of gives me the advantage, meaning they have to come to me rather than me come to them since I can just fire at them from here. As you can see, Queen Bess getting into range, but I don't believe I'm going to target her just yet. I think I might shoot one off. I believe I'm going to wait for this unit of great swords to come back outside of the forest so that I can get a nice clean shot on them. There we go. Seeing sit tagged in those sisters of Avalon there. But ideally, there we go. Immediately change the target to the great swords. But as you can see, not the great swords, swordmaster of as you can see. The Queen Best there just obliterates over half that unit in a single hit. So, uh, yeah, she's pretty good. Here we 
that. Retagged into the great swords. They are in the woods a little bit, so it might be a bit of a difficult shot. But Queen Bess is pretty good. And we get direct hit there, and half that unit's HP is gone just like that. Mortars now getting into range, so I'm going to target this clump over here as they get nearer, because the way this map is formed, which is the Galleon's Graveyard, it kind of forces whoever's come from here to kind of clump up around this corner, especially the AI, you can exploit it quite nicely. But for the most part, once I get spread out into the open field, it's uh, it's all good. But I notice this clump in just a second, I believe I'd retarget Queen Bess. Their artillery getting into range. They're for some reason targeting the Gallows Giant with a, um, what you call them, these Reaver Bolt Throwers. But for some reason, they're using the multiple bolts rather than these single bolts. So that's not going to do much damage because it's not a uh, infantry unit. Hit my depth guard a little bit, but again, not a big deal. Here we are, the Necrofex Colossi getting into range now and everyone's just tagging into this clump and honestly it's kind of disgusting of a slot so let's just watch this one in slow motion because good lord look at that just three are they barrels i think they are they look like barrels to me yeah they certainly are just coming down filled with gunpowder and that's going to be a lot of kills oh it wasn't a direct hit on the uh, old clump but it's going to get a uh, oh it didn't actually kill anyone that is rather disappointing Sorry, those are a load of mortars coming in. I also use the gunnery wides to increase the accuracy of the mortars since they can be a little, uh, little dispersed. Uh, Queen Bess is, uh, she's not doing too well with this choke point for some reason. I don't know what's wrong with it today. The enemy has actually split up their forces, bringing some phoenixes, some great swords, sisters of Avalon, and some dragon princes around this side. Try and target those phoenixes. Phoenixes? Phoenixes with my deck gunners, they don't do too amazingly. Phoenixes are quite difficult to, to take out. They've just got the small hitbox. If it was a dragon, it'd actually be a little bit easier because they'd have a nice big hitbox for me to just spray into. I know it's bringing the cover around, so I send the bloody reaper deck guard and one of my leviathans around to the right to put that to flank. We are artillery is in full swing now. They continue firing for some reason with the incorrect ammo, but that's just fine. Queen Bess is not having a good time. I think it's because she's tagging these guys at the back and they are a little bit spread out. Uh, the unit itself, so she's getting a little bit confused as to where she should be aiming. I could have used alt fire to do that and make it a little bit more bearable, but it's not that big a deal. As you can see, the Leviathan going straight for the Assist of Avalon, so I noticed they were shooting at uh, my Shade Raves here, and they have magical attacks, that's obviously not very good. For some reason, these guys are just kind of walking very slowly towards my units and taking a lot of damage on the way, so of course I just target the deck guns on these, because why not, it's just free kills for them really. As you can see, the Phoenix comes around, shuts down, well, doesn't shut down, keeps her, uh, oh, what's, what's his face, Noctilus busy. Apparently he's drained for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why. So is this guy. Hmm. They barely moved. In fact, they haven't moved, that's very strange. Anyway, here we are, they're using a couple of spells over here, and they're destroying the bloody Reavers. Uh, I should have really given that flank a little bit more attention, maybe pulled a couple of these guys around, but it's not a big deal, honestly. There we are, the Shade Raves going over 70 kills, other deck gunners also doing fantastic work. I'm going to pull these guys up to make sure they don't get into my gunners. Unfortunately, the Bloody Reaver deck guard are going to break and crumble away into non-existence, and these guys are going to come around my side, but we're not, I, uh, I have a plan for that. On the main battlefield, they did pull a charger on here with these Dragon Princes, which I managed to shut down with my other unit of pole arms and another Leviathan, and they are now retreating and doing their best to uh, heal them or give them a bit more confidence so they can come back. Leviathan is just getting in deep into the enemy lines and keeping them all busy so that our deck gunners can continue to do lots of work. The Gallows Giant there, just spraying flamethrowers all over these guys and it is quite a sight to behold. The other Phoenix is now coming in, made out like he was going to do a little charge on the Shade Raves, changed his mind, decided to go for the Gunner White instead. Not to worry, I see these Dragon Princes come around the side, so I use the, what's it called? It's called like the, the Sundial or something, the item that this guy has. I can't remember what it's called, but it basically has it. There it is the Captain Ross Moon Dial. Used so many units of deckhands and just keep those guys busy. I'm not expecting them to do anything whatsoever. Literally, just keep them busy so they don't charge into the backs of my gunners. Pulling the Leviathan back now to assist with this. Also, completely shattering that unit of Swordmasters as they run away. Should really retarget these guys, but with everything else going on, it's a little bit difficult. Deckhands getting a little bit confused and for some reason running this way rather than into the. Uh, into the cav, so that's a bit of a shame. Not to worry though, the Leviathan gets here and he will be sure to keep these guys busy. He might be anti-inventory, but he can really just kind of keep everything busy. Cast of the Invocation of the Heck going down there, just to keep all these guys topped up on HP. Unfortunately, a unit of deck gunners gets pinned down by that Phoenix, even though I pull in the depth guard to help. They are going to just about get out of their lives. Enemy units all starting to shatter now. It is quickly coming to an end. 
and I believe that will be the victory. Just a couple more artillery shots before we close out. And the deck gunners, of course, going to make sure that these Phoenix Guard aren't coming back anytime soon. As we can see, the Queen Bess is just a beautiful creature. Does so much work. 222 kills. That is insane. Noctilus on his Necrofex got 106. The regular Necrofex, 201. Leviathans getting up combined. What's that, about 80? That's pretty good. The Flamethrower Necrofex, 43. Shade Wraith Gunners. I mean, all the other deckhands did pretty good with the Shade Wraith. They obviously did the best because those magical attacks and... Everything just pierced straight through everything. Next, the uh, Gunnery White actually did reasonably well. I never really expect them to get any kills. They're just there to kind of give buffs and ammo. But yes, overall, performed very well. See the melee troops? They didn't really do anything. But uh, that's just fine. That's not really what they're meant to be there for. They're just kind of there to, you know, block the charge. Back to you, Miles. Thanks for that, Miles. That concludes this section of the guide on the Vampire Coast armies. Next time, we'll cover the Lords and Heroes and what they can do for you both in campaign and on the battlefield. Thanks for watching this section of my guide. If you want to check out the other parts, there's a link in the card and in the description for a playlist of the series. Don't forget to vote the poll for your next race you want me to make a guide for, which is linked in the description and the comments. If you enjoyed this video at any point, please do consider leaving that like, as it really does help out a lot. And if you want to see more of this type of video, then maybe click that subscribe button so you stay up to date. After all, it is free. For now though, I was Colonel Dumbers, and I'll see you next turn.